Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, reading at verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Though we'd look for a while this morning, we've studied this passage before, maybe on several occasions, but just look for a little while at uh, our dealings with the devil. Uh, I, I hadn't thought of it earlier this morning, but there's a marvellous verse which I've quoted you before. Men don't believe in the devil now as our fathers used to do. They exchange one creed because it's old for another, because it's new. Goes on to talk about the devil's activities. And of course the atheists all around us will tell us that we're imagining things and that this is all just psychological mumbo jumbo. Uh, but those of us who have known the Lord for any time know that these things are absolutely true. And what we're reading about here is a very real power and a very real personality. Uh, a person in the Bible who is extremely powerful, who was at one time, we learn, I think it's in the book of Isaiah, at the very throne of God, walks amongst the stones, it says, of fire, and was one of the, the covering angels, one of the covering cherubs at the throne of God. Tremendous, powerful creature called the devil here in this opening verse so uh, for a while we'll just look at the dealings of the devil i want to look at three things out of this section that we've read the reality of our enemy first of all then the realms of engagement and finally the rebuttal of error the reality of our enemy the realms of engagement and the rebuttal of error so we see then here the, the mention of the devil. And as I say, this is a very real personality in the scriptures and a very, very powerful one. If you've ever read right through the Old Testament, as I know some of you have and some of you have done many times, you will find that the devil is not mentioned very often. Just really very few times. He's mentioned quite clearly in the book of Job. And we see him at the throne of God there accusing Job, uh, who's a godly man, uh, of trying to find fault with Job and bringing accusations before the throne of God. We read of him moving um, David on one account to number the people. But there is not a lot of mention of Satan in the Old Testament. However, when we come to the New Testament, there's far more mention of the devil. And here, perhaps, I think I'm right in saying that probably in the New Testament, here we have the first mention of the devil now the devil also has assistance the Lord Jesus spoke of hell being prepared for the devil and his angels there was a time in the past when there was a revolt in heaven and we read about how the devil brought down many angels with him they fell from the place that they occupied around the throne of God and if I'm right I think it was about a third of the angels rebelled along with Satan and they are called devils in the Bible. Uh, the modern Bibles and, and even oftentimes many speakers, and I used to do it myself, who use the King James Bible will always talk about demons. You won't find any demons in the King James Bible. Although the Greek word is daimonion, 
the AV translators knew better and they translated it as devils. Um, and so you find that he has assistants who are also called <coughs> devils, but nevertheless there is one principal devil, you might say with a capital D, although here in the first verse it's just a, a small d. Now he has various names. I'm thinking for a while about the reality of our enemy. He has various names in the Bible. Um, I think I'm right in saying, I didn't check the Greek text this morning, but the word devil, I think, with the personal devil, is a translation of the word diabolos. Um, I'm not trying to show off the smattering of Greek I have here, because it really is a smattering, I promise you. But what the Greeks used to do was put words together to make combinations of words. Sometimes you get great long words, which would be two or three Greek words all put together. And diabolos is one of those Greek words. There's a verb in Greek, balain, to throw. And dia is a preposition, which means through. And the idea is casting a, uh, <coughs> diabolos, casting an idea across the courtroom. He's the accuser of the brethren. One who casts, as it were, these accusations across, across the courtroom. So the word diabolos is the accuser. And uh, that's not so much his, his activity here, although he's, he's obviously seeking to tempt the Lord Jesus. We find him called Satan. Uh, we find him called Lucifer in the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Uh, you might remember when uh, uh, Jack Mormon was here and we had our seminar on the versions. Jack Mormon was telling us, if you want to check out whether the Bible that you pick up in the bookshop is any good or not, Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. If you don't find the word God there, put it back on the shelf. And you might remember those of you here, my comment to you was, just get yourself a King James Bible and you won't have to worry about that problem. But Jack referred to that as the hallmark of a sound New Testament. God was manifest in the flesh. That is a very, very clear, possibly the clearest statement in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is God. 1 Timothy 3.16 and Jack said this was the hallmark of a sound New Testament. I would suggest to you, and it is only a suggestion, that the hallmark of the Old Testament is found in Isaiah chapter 14 where there is a reference in our Bible to Lucifer. And I'll read it to you because I don't know the verse quite so well. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how are they cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? So here we have the devil by the name of Lucifer. And uh, you're only going to find that, or let me put it this way, in lots of the Bibles, Lucifer is not here. He's gone. And I would suggest to you that this is another hallmark of a sound copy of the scriptures. This word Lucifer uh, in Isaiah 14, 12. And that means the light bearer. The name Lucifer means the light bearer. You may or you may not be aware that one of the principal, uh, what shall we call him, uh, formers of Masonic uh, teachings, the teachings of Freemasonry, was a man called Bishop Pike. Now, whether he was a bishop in the Presbyterian Church, I'm not sure, quite sure he may have been, but the man was an occultist. And he wrote the book, really, for Freemasons. I can't remember the title of the book. But in that book, he says very clearly that the true worship is the worship of Lucifer. You, you might be interested to know, and I'm, I'm going to try and stay away from politics, uh, but one of the advisors to Barack Obama and a man that's read by some of the leaders over here, like David Cameron, they tell me, is a guy called Saul Alinsky. And he wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. And uh, that book was all about how you subvert governments, how you bring down governments, how you cause disruption. Lots of this is going on now. It's going on in the police, it's going on in the schools, it's going on in the NHS. They're following the teachings of Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals. And he in his book, I'm not sure whether he dedicated, but certainly in his book he praises Lucifer by name. So this is another name of the devil. It means the light bearer. And you remember, can I read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're just thinking, I'll say, about the reality of the enemy for a moment or two here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's concerned about the saints at Corinth because they're being deceived. And he says in verse 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not, ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And then if we read a little further down to verse, excuse me, verse 13, here we find the tie-in with the light bearer. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I knew a man years ago um, who told me that he got saved because there was a light came into his room. Mm, I did really wonder about that. Um, I should have asked him about it because I was young in the faith then, but had I got a bit more sense, I might have said to him, well, that's very nice. I'm glad you could see properly. But what did that light teach you about yourself? What did that light teach you about the Lord Jesus Christ? And what are you trusting? Because people will tell you now about all kinds of weird and wonderful experiences they have. We need to press them to see if they're trusting in the blood of the Lamb. We need to press them to see if they have any conception of what sinners they are and how desperately they need a saviour and whether they have trusted him. Having a light in the room doesn't really convince me very much, particularly, excuse the pun, in the light of what we read here. He's also called, and we read of course in there in 2 Corinthians 11, he's called the serpent. You remember in the garden, he comes disguised as a serpent. We find him de described in the book of the Revelation, chapter 12, as that old serpent, or it might be chapter 13, that old serpent, the devil. Now quite what he looks like um, is difficult to pin, really. It's difficult to pin down. I'm not quite sure he's read all over with a, with a pitchfork and a, a little spike on the end of his tail I'm not quite sure that that's the picture the Bible presents I'm more inclined and you you're quite welcome to disagree but I'm inclined to think he has the face of an ox and we can't go there this morning but I'll gladly talk to you about that over a cup of tea and a biscuit afterwards why I think he looks like an ox uh, certainly facially um, so there is a real enemy we have the Church of Jesus Christ has a very real enemy and no sooner the Lord Jesus appears on the scene, no sooner he's filled with the Holy Ghost at his baptism, than we read that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, there to be tempted of the devil. And if God's going to do a work with you, if you're the Lord's and God's going to do a work with you, you can expect the devil to turn up before too long. If God starts to use you in a big way, you can expect the devil, prom I promise you now, write it down, mark it down, the devil's going to turn up, and give you a hard time one way or the other. I remember very well when our kids were younger, the chaos we used to have on Sunday morning because the devil would get in amongst the family, there'd be fallouts, there'd be all kinds, not every morning, thank God, but sometimes you'd get to church and you'd have steam coming out your ears because it was so difficult to get all the kids in line, showered, a shave and said, well I wouldn't shave with that five and six but you know the, the problems often used to strike us on a on a Sunday morning because the devil would try and cause problems in the family so when I got to church I wouldn't be fit to minister if I was ministering on that occasion which I used to do a great deal more probably then than I do now on a Sunday morning and uh, when you come to the Lord I remember distinctly when I first came to the Lord the devil came after me big time both guns blazing and I could, I could tell you about circumstances where I knew for sure that the devil was trying to strike me down because I was now beginning to profess faith in, the Lord, faith in the Lord Jesus. We have an enemy. He's a real enemy and he's a powerful enemy. And if you're not a Christian this morning, he's out to deceive you and he's very good at it. He's had centuries, he's had millennia of practice and he's brilliant at it. He's in the churches. He's very much in the churches. He uses preachers, he uses pastors, he uses vicars. He uses all sorts of people who profess the name of Jesus, but they don't know him in their hearts. The devil uses such people. We really do have an enemy this morning. We, we read of him also, and we warn about him in uh, the, sixth letter, sorry, the, uh, the sixth chapter of the letter to the Ephesians. And this is a great study all on its own, but just a couple of verses here. Um, 
Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 finally my brethren Paul says at the end of his letter finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil that's the craftiness okay the slick way the smooth way the deceitful way the convincing way they operates put on the whole armour of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The atheist can mock if he wishes, but the devil's got Adam running around in circles. And finally, if they continue to mock, not only at, the God, at God, but at the devil, they'll find themselves in hellfire. I'm, I'm rather disappointed that I never thought to write down these verses that I had about the devil which I've quoted you before because they're very good but never mind we must move on. Let me just say this one other thing before we look at the realms of engagement. He will attack when we are at our weakest and he will also attack when we are at our most triumphant because in the latter case he can get us through pride after Elijah had that great victory over the prophets of Carmel and the prophets of Jezebel's table 850 of them you remember round about 1 Kings 18 Elijah has this great victory we find him depressed Jezebel opens her mouth and says she's going to see to it that he gets killed and he runs like a frightened rabbit and we find him depressed the devil got to he's not mentioned there in the text but he, he gets to Elijah after a great victory but if you're down also and you're weak and times are tough that's when he'll come and give you an extra kicking so be on the lookout for that he's no friend uh, of christians particularly he's no friend of anybody the stupidity the absolute crass stupidity of these people that claim to worship satan they are so stupid it is beyond belief he's going to grind them to dust that's what he's going to do. He's going to make sure they wind up in hell and they stay there. And they are mad enough to proclaim that they worship him. So the enemy is real, the reality of our enemy. But then what about the realms of engagement? We all know, or perhaps I'm sure most of us are aware, that when we speak of the kinds of ways in which the devil attacks, there are three principal areas that the Bible speaks of. The world, the flesh and the devil himself. Now the devil actually uses the world and uses the flesh and we see all these in the reading that we had here in Matthew 4 uh, and we'll look at them one by one just now but also we read of another aspect of it which I pointed out to you before you're familiar with I'm sure in John's first letter and the second chapter his letter not his gospel the second chapter verse 16 he says for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the world, the flesh and the devil are the three areas where we're going to be attacked. And we are going, if you're a real Christian this morning, you're going to be attacked. If you're just a church going professor and you've got no life in you, you're not a problem to him. He's going to leave you alone. You're going to have a quiet life. But if you mean business, you're really the Lord's. Expect to be attacked. There's warnings enough. There's armour enough. There's provision enough. As fearful he is, God is greater. Keep that in mind. If I paint a pretty black picture of the devil this morning, God is far more powerful. Don't forget that. We mustn't forget that. Put on the whole armour of God, says Paul. And we'll think a little bit about that later. So we find in, here in Matthew uh, 4, in the temptation, we find these three areas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life now when the bible talks about the lust of the flesh it's not just talking about uh sex let's have a look for a moment at verse 3 here in matthew 4 when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread so we're not just talking when we speak of the lust of the flesh we're not just talking about what the modern bibles think lust is most of modern translators couldn't find a bowling ball in the bathtub 
You don't want to waste your time with that stuff, okay? This is sound. What we're reading this morning is a sound Bible. And lust, one preacher described it, I remember when I was a young fella, as desire off the leash. Lust is desire off the leash. It's when you're out of control. That's what lust is. It's a lack of restraint. Now here, the Lord Jesus had been fasting 40 days, 40 nights, and we read, he was afterward and hungered. So he's weak. Then the tempter comes. He comes when he's weak. He comes when he's hungry. And he says, turn these stones into bread. Now, bread is legitimate. Some of us will go home and probably before the day's out, we'll have some bread, I dare say. Nothing wrong with that, of itself. And Jesus was hungry. But everything must be in the will of God. Um, one of the great sins and problems these days, of course, is gluttony. And the Lord Jesus perhaps alludes to that when he says, In the days of Noah, they ate and they drank. Just as it was in the days of Noah, when the Son of Man comes, they ate and they drank. On the way over here, for us, it's about 45 minutes for us, but you probably pass billboards too. All the time we are invited to eat some turkey for Christmas or to buy some of this. And there are food posters all over the place. And it was when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The eyes can be a real problem. But here he's being tempted to do something miraculous. To prove that he's the son of God. If they be the son of God. Command that these stones may be made bread. Work a miracle. If you're the son of God. Do a miracle. And there's people today, um, it's, it still draws crowds today, the so-called miracle workers in the churches. I had a brother say to me, I believe he is a brother, say to me recently, we, we had 14 people saved last week and somebody raised from the dead. Well, pardon me if I don't get too excited because, you know, that all, these kind of things are always going on in great, big, enormous, charismatic churches. So they would have us believe. And that's the draw. That's what, the people want to see something. They want to see a miracle and then they'll believe. But we know, don't we, from the story of the rich man and Lazarus, that they won't believe even if somebody rose from the dead. It's the word of God that people need to hear. It's the word of God that brings faith. Faith cometh by hearing, says the Bible, and hearing by the word of God. And the devil can work miracles. We see that in the book of Job. Now the Saviour was not a performer. When he did his miracles, they were oftentimes in secret, but they were always compassionate. They were always for the good of the person touched. They were never for show. And I would suggest that many of these so-called evangelists and so-called preachers that do what they consider miracles are just for you to get the idea what great men they are. And usually they're not. And then there's the lust of the eyes. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now first of all the Lord Jesus didn't say they're not yours to give because they were. When, Satan, when Adam rebelled in the garden he handed over the creation to Satan. And so Satan legitimately here says to the Lord these things I will give thee. Uh, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The world at the moment is in the grip of the evil one. It's in his hands. God can override everything he does. We often sing he's got the whole world in his hands. We're not talking about the devil, we're talking about God. God is over all, but nevertheless Satan has much power and authority in the world today. When the Lord Jesus comes, and we've been thinking about that this morning, he's going to lift the curse off the earth. He's going to bind the devil in hell. He will not be loose like he is now. And then the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And things will be very different on earth. It'll be a wonderful time, I'm sure. A thousand years of glorious rain. So what we have here is the lust of the eyes. Taking the opportunity to exceed in mountain and showeth him all the kingdom of the world. All these will I give thee if thou wilt walk, walk, fall down and worship me. Possessions can be a real snare materialism can be a real snare for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth paul says try saying possesseth it's a good job i haven't got dentures paul says covetousness is idolatry possessions can be a real snare
for sinners for sure but for Christians too because they, they can get into your heart they clog the heart up they, they have the affections occupied the heart occupied that place occupied that really belongs only to the Lord that's what idolatry is and if there's anything in this world that you love more than the Lord Jesus Christ that's an idol anything in this world that make you do what he doesn't want that thing is an idol and we're to tear them down um, the problem with possessions is that they can misdirect our energy so many especially of course unsaved people live for things they're always wanting better wages they're always wanting bigger houses they're always wanting better furniture there's always some lure to keep their minds occupied day and night with vanities with useless things that will perish with the using one of the, one of the lovely things you know that the more you read your bible we're going to get into this the more you start to have the mind of christ the more you begin to see things the way god sees them the more you see through the vanity of this world the more you detect that it's not really so much of what is offered to us is not for our good i remember gene and i had been down to london i think it was one of our trips to the museum before we went before we took a party from the church gene and i went down <coughs> three times. and i remember one night we were coming back and we were sitting in the railway station i don't know which one it was i think it was euston and uh, we we had half an hour to kill so we're sitting upstairs waiting for our train to, time to come up and there's a huge poster a huge poster with somebody just slunk in a hammock with their hands hung over the side on a beautiful beach with the blue sky and the blue sea in the background and i think it said something like this is the life and i thought to myself no it's not no it's not i am come that they might have a life and have it more abundant life does not consist of lying on the beach life does not consist of lying in bed life does not consist in idleness life consists in serving the lord jesus christ i am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly and i was struck by this huge i mean it was big 20 feet across at least for everybody in the station to see this idea that idleness is living now i'm not saying you shouldn't go on a holiday and i'm not saying you shouldn't lie on the beach if that's what turns you on and i'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy the countryside but that's far short of the life that the lord jesus came to bring us <clears throat> And the pursuit of those kinds of things can misdirect us. They may not be sinful in themselves. It's not necessarily sinful to have a little bit of time on the beach. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. As long as it's come by honest labour. It's not a sin to be rich. You know, when I was a young Christian, I used to have, I used to have a kind of a sneering attitude towards preachers in swanky suits. If I met a preacher with a gold watch and a swanky suit, I didn't think much of him. Now I was wrong. I was wrong to do that. I'm sure I was. Maybe if you've got a wardrobe full of them and half a dozen Amiga watches, I might begin to be more suspicious these days. Uh, but the problem with materialism and riches is that they they can often create pride, and we're getting a little bit into the next temptation. But you know, uh, Asaph writing Psalm 73 makes us aware of this. If you want to look at Psalm 73 with me for a minute I'm not going to be very long this morning Psalm 73 this is a psalm of Asaph and in verse 3 we read for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked for well, there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Because they are rich, they become proud and some of the biggest problems we have in the world today 
are rich men. James warns about this too. They think because they are rich, they are obviously smart, and therefore the rest of us dummies need to do what they tell us we need to do. Some of them actually come out and openly said so. There's one very well-known man, I won't mention his name, very well-known man, I think he's a billionaire, He's one of the founders of what's called the Council on Foreign Relations. And he, and he says, in effect, democracy is baloney. You need smart people like us to run the world. And he thinks he's smart probably because he's rich. That's what, pride, that's what money can do. That's what possessions can do. We find the same thing in Paul's letter to Timothy, the first letter. I think, you know, as a young believer, one of the things that the Lord just kept hitting me with constantly was to beware of materialism. And so these kinds of verses always stayed with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me ask you Christians, would you swap your Bible for a million pounds? Would you do it? I mean, if it was an NIV or something, I could understand. <laughs> but a KJV, would you swap your King James Bible for a million pounds? Would you swap your opportunities daily to open the Bible already? If somebody came along and said, I'll give you a million pounds to go to Christianity, would he get any takers here this morning? I hope not. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I, hon I honestly believe I don't think I would take the money. I think if they offered me 10 million, I don't think I would take the money. Because I found contentment. <laughs> and riches, they take wings and they fly away. That's the trouble. And many a millionaire is an unhappy man or woman. Reading on in verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and he's certain we can carry nothing out. There's no pockets in a shroud, as my father-in-law used to say. Verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root King James Bible is spot on here the others are wrong for the love of money is the root of all evil the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows and down to verse 17 charge them that are rich in this world to give away their money no charge them that are rich in this world that they shouldn't be rich no charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded there's the danger there's the pride nor trust in uncertain riches there's the other danger but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. In other words, if you're rich, do some good with it. Be generous with it. Spill it over. Cast your bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. So we have the lust of the eyes here then in chapter 4. And we also have the pride of life, verses 5 and 6. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. The desire for greatness. Show how great you are. Throw yourself down from the top of the temple. And this is a terrible sin that afflicts us. The desire to be somebody. The desire for greatness. Well, I have found that as we read the Bible and as the Holy Spirit instructs us, as we walk with Jesus, uh, we learn about ourselves. And we begin to understand that there's nothing great about us. That there's only one who deserves praise. There's only one who is truly great. And it's not me and it's not you. I'm sorry to tell you, it's not you. And generally speaking, the younger folk are, the, more, the greater they think they are. It's the temptation of youth, the hubris of youth, as my son called it. The older we get, I mean, there's no fool like an old fool. And to believe those kind of things when you're old, you, you really are stupid. But for Christians, 
when we're taught by the Holy Spirit, we should learn, we should have learned, we should be learning that we're not great at all, that we deserve to go to hell. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I get a bit uh, gloomy because I feel like I'm 66 and I've done nothing for the Lord. And I think, you know, it's great what's going on at Hellier Street, but I'd like to see more. And, uh, and then I remind myself, wait a minute, I should be in hell. Thank God that I can do anything. Thank God if I can touch one person. It's a, it's a blessing. Paul talked about his ministry in the first chapter of Galatians as being because of God's grace. That he had been a blasphemer and he had been an idolater and he had been a persecutor. But the grace of God, he said, reached me and made me a servant. So if you're sometimes inclined to be a bit down because maybe you feel you haven't done enough for the Lord or you're not doing enough for the Lord, maybe the challenge is valid. Maybe there's something you need to think about. But also it's just possible. You need to remember that what you deserve is hellfire. And if you can do anything for the Lord, you should thank God for that. The desire for greatness, the pride of life, I don't know if you sometimes like me you watch some of the atheists on YouTube and they are so smug aren't they they think they're so smart with their dumb stupid comments on the Bible and because they think they're intelligent the pride of life takes over and you can see the smugness written all over there and the mockery and the scorn that they heap upon the Bible but it's because they don't know what they are they're ignorant now these three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are hit upon the Lord Jesus in full power but it's lust upon the Saviour. There was nothing in him that would take the bait and there's still nothing in him and there never will be anything in him that will take that bait. He alone is sinless, the Bible teaches us. The Muslims will tell you that Abraham was sinless and the prophets were sinless and Moses was sinless and Muhammad was sinless but now there's only one sinful man sinless man that ever lived and that's the Lord Jesus Christ and this was why Satan was wasting his breath trying to tempt the Saviour on these grounds there was never a man like the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why he alone can save that's why he alone is the Saviour there's no man there never has been a man like the Lord Jesus Christ so we've spoke about the reality of the enemy. We've spoke about the realms of engagement. Just finally, the rebuttal of the error. The first answer that the Lord Jesus makes defeats every temptation. Look at verse 7. Sorry, it's not verse 7, is it? It's um, verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I recommended a memory verse to you a while back uh, that it's worth getting to know and getting to know verbatim. 1 Corinthians 10 13. For hath, there hath no temptation overtaken you, but such as is come unto man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation. Uh, sorry, God is faithful. Say, I forgot myself. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may have. That is a precious, precious promise. Believe me. When you come under severe temptation, if you know First Corinthians 10 13, it's such a help. But I would suggest to you here is another verse that you would do well to commit to memory. Verse 4 Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And we find in verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again. And in verse 10, Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Sometimes people will come to you and say, So and so is going to happen, or this always happens when such and such is the case. Just be careful. If it's not scripture, it's not necessarily true. If it's scripture, you can hang on to it, you can believe it, you can trust it. But if it's not scripture, just don't rush out to make a decision. You know, the jury should be out a while. What we know to be true is the word of God. And what we see here is the Lord Jesus repelling the devil, rebuking the devil, sending the devil away, just with the word of God. 
And um, this is how you deal with the enemy. With the word of God. Taking the sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6. This is how you deal with those thoughts that come to you sometimes. And you don't know where they come from. That can crush you and make you depressed. This is how you deal with the threats that come from unbelievers. Come back to the word of God. Hide it in your heart. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Get to know it. The Lord Jesus does not rely, I'm ahead of myself slightly here, he does not rely on his own authority. He doesn't say, well I'm God and I'm telling you so and so. He says, it is written. And he's an example for us. That's the way we do it. Get to know the scriptures and you'll have the answers. Can I take you, I'm going to do this just finally to uh, Proverbs, I think it's round about chapter 24. I'll find it if it isn't. It's in that area. I was looking at this a day or two ago. Proverbs. Go for 24. Sorry, it's 26. Proverbs 26. And here's a place that many a, an unbeliever would like to make fun of. Proverbs chapter 26. Verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Wait a minute. Verse 4 says we're not to answer the fool, and verse 5 says we are. There's a con contradiction in the Bible, says the critic. So how do we resolve these seeming contradictions? I was, uh, I've got one or two answers I've come across from commentators from time to time. But I was reading Andrew Fuller this week and he seems to have the best understanding of this. Let's just read these two verses again. Verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So it looks like a contradiction, doesn't it? It looks like verse 4 says we're not to answer and verse 5 says we are. Andrew Fuller, I think, has the best interpretation I've ever seen. He says both of the fools in verse 4 and for verse 5 should be answered. But in verse 4 it means don't give a foolish reply. Answer, their, answer a fool, sorry, answer not a fool according to his folly. Don't answer foolishly. And the, less, the rest of the verse makes that clear. Lest thou also be like unto him. So if you ask a foolish question, and a fool oftentimes in the book of Proverbs is a wicked man, don't descend to his level when you answer. But you should answer. Verse 5 means deal with the foolishness and don't stand by as an unconcerned spectator lest he boast. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. We should be ready with an answer. Peter tells us to have an answer. And we're not going to have answers. The Lord Jesus had an answer every time. It is written, it is written, it is written. And if we're not reading our Bibles, we're not going to have an answer. It seems to me, I've said this a dozen times, I've said it a hundred times, all today's Christians seem to want to do is sing. And maybe eat. That's, that's what they go to church for, they just want to sing. Sing some more choruses. Sing along a pastor. Just want to sing. No, we should be students of the scriptures. And we're not going to be strong. And we're not going to defeat the enemy. And we're not going to answer a fool according to his folly. If we're not studying the word of God. I would hope, I would hope that when you come to church, when you hear me preach or you hear any other preachers, you get something of spiritual food that makes it worth coming. I, I can understand why some Christians leave their churches because they go and they come out starving every time they go and I can and then people say you know you why why do you go into that church that's so far away when you when this church is on your doorstep or why are you leaving that church when you've been there for years and the answer is because I'm starving to death seems to me that's a pretty good reason to move on I'd like you believers to pray with me that we get some food from this platform whoever the preacher is Sundays, Saturdays and Wednesdays that there's bread on the table. You know, I used to be a drummer, most of you probably know. And I remember there was a guy who used to play bass, used to run a shop in town, a music shop. And he used to say, 
I wouldn't put my coat, this was, what would it be, 40 years ago, I wouldn't put my coat on for less than a fiver. Uh, what he meant was, you know, you're, I'm not going to go and play bass for people for peanuts. But, um, and I often feel, you know, as a preacher, that if, 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 you, if you have to sit and listen to me, you ought to get something. If you, you know, if you came last night to listen to Steve Elliott, I hope you came expecting to get something, I think we did. And whoever's preaching next week, I'm not quite sure, we want some food on the table. And it's important, therefore, that the preachers be students of Scripture. But it's important for us that we have an appetite too. Sometimes God might remove a man from a church because the people don't want the food. You might be in a situation where you've got a good preacher, but God takes him away because you can't be bothered to come, you don't want the food, or you're critical or whatever. Some of the old saints, you know, when I was a young brother, when I was a young believer some of the, the more godly saints rarely complained about who the speaker was what they were concerned with was did I get anything out of the word of God and that's all that matters it doesn't really matter in a sense who stands here as long as it's thus saith the Lord because the glory all belongs to God doesn't it the glory is all the Lord's but we are to answer a fool according to his folly we cannot do that and I'm not just talking about preachers, I'm talking about every Christian. You're going to run into them this week. Leah ran into them last week. You're going to run into them. We're going to run into them. We need to have an answer ready. Um, just one last point, and I have finished, I promise. One last point. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. What does that mean? I think it means he was tempted according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are, that summarises the whole realm of temptation. And the Lord Jesus was tempted in that way. And the temptation went on, of course, throughout his ministry. Ministry. They worked in shifts, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. They worked in shifts to try and trip him up. But you read Isaiah 50 and verse 4 sometime, you'll see why they couldn't trip him up. Because every morning, God wakened his ear to hear as the learned. He was instructed in the scriptures. And the Pharisees used to say, where did this man get his learning? <laughs> and they still don't get it. The Pharisees still don't get it. How can a man that hasn't been to Bible college possibly be a preacher? Well, maybe he read the Bible. <laughs> and if you'll read the Bible, you'll put many of these pastors to shame. Read your Bible. Don't be neglectful. And if you can get onto the ministry, if you can't get here, pray for it. If you can get here, get here. Amen. Well,